our voice is a powerful expression tool. It delivers words. But it also delivers a message that goes beyond the words. Let me give an example. A few weeks ago, a friend calls me and offers a free ticket to a football game. Well, naturally, I was very happy, jumping on the opportunity, but as I was about to leave the door, my wife turns to me and asks, uh, where, are you, where are you going? I'm going to a football game with John. Is everything okay? Yes, you go ahead with your friends. I'll be just fine. <laughs> Sounds familiar? At that point, I knew I was in trouble, but not because of what she said. I was in big trouble because of the way she said it. I trust you can be a compliment from a good friend or ally. But change that intonation, and these same words can mean something completely different. Our emotions are reflected in our vocal intonation. For example, most of you have probably sensed by now that I'm using enthusiasm to hide the fact that I'm also a little nervous standing in front of so many people here. Combined with our body language, our vocal intonation also tells a lot about our personality, who we are. Now, none of you here know me, you've only heard me for two minutes, but yet each and every one here has already constructed a mental image of who I really am. And that mental image is surprisingly similar. So, how many people of you here think that I'm a shy and reclusive introvert that started his career in bookkeeping before moving on to marketing. One. Two. Well, we'll get to that in a second. We all understand emotions, right? But machines don't. Our modern-day machines understand quite a lot, actually. They understand what we touch and type, they understand what we say and click, they understand where we are and what position in space we are, but they do not understand how we feel. And they are clueless to what we mean. When it comes to emotion, our modern-day machines are still running blind. But that's about to change. Our mission is to enable our machines to understand our well-being and our emotions, allowing them to interact with us on an emotional level and become much, much better. Now, as for me, in all brutal honesty, I was never a bookkeeper, and if you were to tell my friends that I was a shy and reclusive introvert, they'd probably laugh, perhaps buy you a drink. In truth is, my father wanted me to be an engineer like him. I, on the other hand, decided to become a sous chef cooking southern French cuisine in a chic restaurant in Tel Aviv, my hometown. When I finally understood the difference between passion and career, I quit, took a degree in economics, and went on to become um, a journalist, a financial journalist, um, looking at facts to find the stories. After completing an MBA, I uh, decided to combine my passion and uh, skills and become a technology marketeer, which I've been doing for the last 18 years worldwide. The last three of them, building our company, which brings me back to what I do. I work on emotions analytics, analyzing our raw vocal modulations to understand our well-being and emotions in real time. Together with a talented group of people, our technology understands three basic things. We understand the speaker's mood, we understand the speaker's attitude, and we understand the speaker's longer-term emotional state, which also plays a key part in our wellness and well-being. Ever since uh, Siri introduced a few years ago, voice is becoming the man-machine interface of choice to deliver uh, differentiation and utility to products and services. All tech companies have been using or are using voice to let consumers better interact with personal devices and applications but they've only scratched the surface of what is truly possible. Let me give you an example. So back in 2010, then Apple CEO Steve Jobs went on stage for an interview with Walt Mossberg and Kara Swisher, co-editors of All Things Digital. 
Um, an interview, by the way, that became a Silicon, uh, a Silicon Valley classic. During that interview, Walt asked Steve about the invention of the iPad. We took that part of the video, extracted the voice out of it, ran it through a cloud-based engine. See how the technology uh, deciphers Steve's emotions as they shift from one end to the other in a scope of about a minute and a half. Here it goes. You didn't do it in a tablet right away. You did it in the phone. What was the, uh, I mean, did you consider doing a tablet when you did the iPhone, or, or was it just a natural progression? The iPhone came out, it was a big hit. I'll actually tell you kind of a secret. Nope. <laughs> okay. Uh, I actually started on the tablet first. Really? And uh, I had this idea of being able to get rid of the keyboard, type on a multi-touch glass display. And I asked our folks, could we come up with a multi-touch display that I could, we could type on, I could rest my hands on and actually type on. And about six months later, they called me in and showed me this prototype display. And it was amazing. And I gave it to one of our guys. This was in the early 90s. I mean, early, uh, early 2000s. 2000, yeah. And uh, I gave it to one of our other really brilliant uh, UI folks. And he called me back a few weeks later, and he had inertial scrolling working and a few other things. Now, we were thinking about building a phone at that time. And when I saw the rubber band inertial scrolling and a few of the other things, I thought, my God, we can build a phone out of this. And I put the tablet project on the shelf because the phone was more important. And we went and took the next several years and did the iPhone. So and then... And when we, got our, when we got our wind back and uh, thought we could take on something next, pulled the tablet off the shelf, took everything we learned from the phone, and went back to work on the tablet. My God, we can build a phone out of it. Up until that moment, Steve's was quite gloomy. He was looking at the, at the floor, swiveling in his chair, mixing up the words, not being, really being in the interview. It takes about 10 to 15 seconds for our technology to come up with an analysis. And that analysis is quite depressive, with a lingering undertone of loneliness and fatigue. But then Steve shares that revelation. He's straightened up. He looks to Walt straight in his eye. He's sharp and focused, and the analysis turns abrasive. The last switch happens just before the end of the clip. He says, uh, we decided to put the tablet project on the shelf because the iPhone was more important. We can see a different person, a practical person. Creativity, passion, control, the CEO is back. Now, this, interesting, this story has an interesting epilogue. As natural skeptics, we'd like to validate everything we're doing, but there's a problem here. How do we validate such a thing? Lucky enough, we met Walt, now heading record a few months ago, and showed him the clip. Walt sat down, leaned back in his chair, and told us this was spot on. He then continued to give us a behind the scene viewpoint of him and Carr of that interview, what happened in the interview before and after. Although not purely scientific, this is nevertheless a validation we would never forget. I've been using the same kind of technology on myself here tonight. It's uh, on a free app called uh, Moody's, um, and I've judged my own speech as I was giving to you. It tells me <laughs> belief, conviction, enthusiasm, action based on belonging. I wish I could show it to you, but sometimes the uh, technology is even harder. You can use it yourself. Uh, it's a free demo, completely free demo app. So what do we do with this? What do we do with technology? Understanding emotion applies to almost everything we do, from uh, working out to understanding brands to providing service in call centers to interacting with our um, uh, loved one and even with our smartphone personal assistants. Imagine asking Siri, hey Siri, how am I doing? And getting a real answer. Looks like you had a rough day. You sound unenergetic. Perhaps we should start a short, brief exercise plan, or just stuff your head with ice cream. There happens to be a great ice cream shop just around the corner. Let me navigate you there. 
At this point, usually people come and ask us three questions. They say, does this thing work in any language? Can I use it as a lie detector? Would it make a better world or worse? Let me take the first one. Are non-linguistic cues, such as body language and, and vocal modulation, were all created before we humans uh, developed language, which makes them completely universal? Let me give you an example. Try to follow what I'm saying by reading the slides behind me. Tinukot lo mevinim af milah, aval mevinim bidiyuk ma shanachnu meshaderim lai. הם יודעים כשאנחנו שמחים או עצובים, רגועים או נרגשים. הם מבינים בדיוק עד כמה אנחנו אוהבים אותם. Yes, the language of passion is truly universal. We know this because we've been researching the science of emotions for the last 20 years. Ran our technology with internal and external validations, collected more than 1 million voice samples from more than 170 countries in dozens of languages. But you don't need all this data to know this on an intuitive level. Just think of any foreign-based movie you've ever seen. Switch off the subtitles, you'll still get it. You'll understand the scene, the relationship between the hero and the heroine. I know what some of you are thinking, but Italians, they sound so much angrier. Well, <laughs> they might, especially, by the way, if you tell them that Mercedes is kicking Ferrari butt in Formula One, but take a stereotypical Swede. When that stereotypical Swede decides to finally express anger, he will do this in the same pattern as that stereotypical Italian, um, Japanese, German, Israeli. We are all wired that way, but not just us. Ever wondered how come the family dog always know when to jump and lick our faces and when to take cover behind the kitchen table? Detecting lies. Can this detect lies? Well, no. Sorry for the anticlimax. Lying is a cognitive decision. We know what the truth is. We decide to tell something different. Good liars lie with no emotional baggage. Good actors get Oscars for lying. That's what good acting is all about. And not just actors and psychopaths, or in this case, an actor playing a psychopath. We all do this every day. We call this politeness. We call this proper social conduct. But in essence, it's not really different. Example, sure, have a nice day. <laughs> Better world, would this make our privacy, um, other worlds safe? Well, while many people look at emotions understanding as a way to decipher, surreptitiously decipher, the emotions of the person standing in front of us, in reality, we are all good at understanding our peers. Yes, even males are good at it. But what about understanding ourselves? What makes us happy? How do we come across? Sometimes the biggest unknown is the one closest to home. Let me share an experience with you. A few months ago, I was uh, showcasing our technology in a very large conference in Las Vegas, doing back-to-back -back meetings for days on end. Um, one of the routines I used was to take Moody's, record my voice, and share the output with my counterparts. One night afternoon, I did just that projecting enthusiasm, only to have the machine speed back to me readings of gloominess, loneliness, and anxiety. I said, I'm sorry, something must be wrong with the server, and I pressed the play button. What I heard next shocked me. It was the crackling old voice of a sad, tired person, and that person was me. I was washed out, and I was completely unaware of that. The following day, Moody's kept on speeding disproportionate readings of gloominess and tiredness. A headache started to appear from nowhere. Um, I took an aspirin as the plane took off, landed home, and went to bed and stayed there for the next three days. Here's an idea. Why just let machines understand our emotions? How about helping us understand ourselves better? What makes us happy? What improves our wellness and well-being situation? When it comes to measuring ourselves, voice is probably the most expressive, versatile output our body produces. And we produce a lot of it. Morning, noon, afternoon, evening, nights. We talk to our peers, we talk to ourselves. Some of us even talk during our sleep. Imagine having a passive, non-intrusive, continuous way to constantly measure our emotions, our well-being, even our health, anytime, anywhere. 
helping us with our diet and exercise, understand, uh, when, you know, understand when we're lonely, elevating our depression, helping us figure out what makes us feel good. We view a world in which personal devices understand our emotions and our well-being, helping us become better in tune with ourselves and with the message we send to our peers. Emotions understanding can help us find new friends, unlock new experiences, but ultimately figure out what makes us truly happy. Thank you. It's, uh, it's been emotional.